Hey, I'm Christopher John Farley, a senior editor with The Wall Street Journal. Today, my guest is Neil Gaiman. He's the author of the new book, North Mythology. Thanks for coming to The Wall Street Journal. Thank you for having me, Chris. Yeah, so this book is kind of a change of pace for you because you're known for books like Coraline and, of course, for the Sandman comic book series. But in this, you sort of delve into the myths of North mythology and you sort of retell them in kind of a different style. Uh, what gave you the idea to do this book? Well, I've used Norse mythology a lot in the last 30 years of writing. I, I had the characters Odin and Thor and Loki um, in Sandman when I came to do my novel American Gods uh, about 17 years ago. I brought them to America and made them contemporary. Um, that's being filmed right now as a TV series. So I, I've been using the characters and using the mythology as a building brick, as an ingredient in the fiction for a long time. Um, but the idea of telling it straight was something that I probably would not have had the hubris mm -hmm. to do until I was actually asked by Amy Cherry from Norton. And uh, we had lunch about eight years ago, and she said, think about retelling these myths for a new generation. Mm -hmm. And initially, I found it very off-putting. And I went back, and I reread the, the original stories, uh, early translations of them, uh, Snorri's prose edda, the poetic edda looking at the stories, and then I started to think about how you would do it and how you could retell it. And finally, after several years of nervously putting it off, I started to retell it. And what I found was that I had a voice. What I found was I loved the clarity of the process, but I also loved as, as a sort of strange exercise the idea of doing something that was, in essence, a cover song, um, that was doing something that other people had didn't before, done before, but trying to do it my way. It's like actors who get to go, well, other people have played Hamlet. Now I get to play Hamlet. You're not in competition with them. You're just taking this thing and doing it your way. So of course, these myths about Odin, about Thor, they've been around for thousands of years. You say you're telling it your way. What are you adding to the process? What will people get out of reading North mythology that they wouldn't have gotten from reading some of these other versions of these tales that have been around for some time? Well, uh, what you're getting from me that you're not going to get from Snorri Sturluson is an awareness that I'm telling these stories to a 20th century audience, a uh -huh. uh, 21st century audience, and that I'm telling them now. Um, I fell in love with them reading uh, Roger Lancel and Green's retellings in the early 60s, uh, which even then were old retellings. Um, I fell in love with them again in my 20s, reading Kevin Crossley Holland's retellings of them. So it's something that, that the action of retelling them and what you choose to emphasize and how you choose to tell them is always fun. I, what I loved the idea of doing here was making a set of stories that felt accessible going for clarity, going for humor when possible, going for a sense that, yes, you are being told the stories, you are being told them accurately, I'm not inventing stuff, I'm not filling stuff in. Um, but also, there's the joy there of telling a joke and telling it well. You may have a, a simple joke that, you know, a man walks into the bar, he sits down, there is an elephant on the other side of the room, and you go, well, yeah, but how are you gonna tell that joke? Well, you know, he had a long day, and he went down into the bar, it was one of those basement bars, he went down a bunch of steps, went in, ordered his usual from the barman, went and sat down, looks around the room, and there in the corner is the biggest muddiest elephant you've ever seen, and it is sipping a gin and tonic, and suddenly we're in the story. And that, for me, was the joy of things, was just making these stories mine. Now, one thing that I got out of the book is that it felt like, instead of a collection of singles, which myths sometimes feel like, it felt like a whole album, that you were building up towards something, that, you know, you drop hints about Ragnarok coming, you know, uh, uh, one god 
losing the sword that he was going to need later on, and just knowing that this big tragedy is going to envelop all of these gods, all these characters that you care about. Is that something you were also trying to communicate, making into a whole novel instead of, sort of just a collection of short stories? Absolutely, but I didn't know that it was going to do that until the end. Hmm. I was doing that all the way through while writing them, going, okay, I'm always heading towards Ragnarok. Um, but I was writing them out of sequence. I was just going, okay, what, what would be fun to write today? I think I'll write Thor losing his hammer and being forced to dress up as beautiful Freya, uh, accompanied by Loki in order to get it back. Or I think I'll write this story. Once they were all done, laying them out in order and writing Ragnarok last, because I knew I had to write Ragnarok last, um, it really felt like, a, like, a, like it had taken on a novelistic structure. You know, it's not a novel because these are retellings of old stories. And, but it does feel inevitable. It feels in shape, like it goes somewhere, as if it has a pattern. I remember when I was back in school, they always told you that myths were something that, the, that people did back in the olden days to sort of explain the world, you know, the, the, where the stars are, the, why the sun comes up in the morning. But uh, you know, Joseph Campbell you know, the, um, also wrote about the fact that myths also tell us stuff about ourselves, and that's why they're important. Why do you think the North myths are important? What do they tell us about ourselves when we read them? I think what, what's interesting about these myths is they almost never do this thing of, and this is why you know, this star shines, and this is why you know, you'll get a little bit of this is what the rainbow is. Mm. This is why you have to trim your fingernails. Um, but mostly what they tell us is who the Vikings were, who, who the people were who told these stories. And you really feel these are being told in a country of endless days followed by endless nights. These are being told in a country where will, winter will kill you if you go outside. So now, um, you are in a smoke-filled hall with your friends drinking until you go unconscious and things are going to get dark. Um, and more than that, they also, I think, talk about the, the way that the Vikings viewed life. Mm. In the Viking world, there were two kinds of death and only two kinds of death. There was a good death which meant that you had fallen bravely in battle. And as such, you would go to Valhalla, where Odin uh, would, would make sure that you were fed and watered and meaded. And you'd get up each day, and you would fight to the death with your friends, and then get up and do it all over, the, over again. Or there were bad deaths. And that could be a death of old age, death in childbirth, death of starvation, any kind of death um, that was not falling bravely in battle was a bad death. And for that, you would go to Hell's kingdom, to the land of Hell. And Hell herself was a woman who, on one side of her face, appeared very beautiful. She was one of Loki's daughters. And on the other side, she looked like a dead person, a rotting corpse. And she in this horrible, gloomy, dark land ruled over everybody who did not die nobly in battle. And you, you look at that and you go, OK, well, this is definitely a culture where if these people are coming for you and your village, you had probably better get out quick because you're not going to intimidate them. All they want to do is either take your village or die bravely in battle. Yeah, n neither of those two deaths sound very good to me. I think I'd want to have a third kind where I could sort of relax on both sides of the equation, but <laughs> maybe that's not the North way. North, I was going to say, that's not the North way. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, it's interesting for me having to convey that point of view to, to a modern reader. Um, you're trying to take attitudes, take ways of seeing the world that uh, belong to the world of 1,500 years ago and say, OK, how does that relate to now? Now, of course, a lot of modern readers are familiar with the Norse myths through, through the comics, a world that you're well familiar with. Um, you know, Thor and Loki and the movies and the comic books and Tom Hiddleston playing Loki in the movies. Um, did you feel like you were in competition with this vision of Thor and the, the myths that you're writing about that's already out there? And what will people who are familiar with those comics 
find that's different or surprising in this book? I didn't feel in competition at all. I, as a six-year-old boy, my first encounter with, with the Norse gods was meeting Thor in British black and white reprints of Marvel comics. And what I then wanted to do was find out more about him because he was great. And that was what sent me to Roger Lancel and Green. So from my perspective, the Thor comics, the Thor movies are wonderful because they tell people that these things exist and that there are things to know and that it could be fun. And Tom Hiddleston's Loki is a glorious and wonderful creature. He is the god of mischief and evil and tricksiness. The Loki in Norse mythology isn't him. Um, he's, to my mind, much more interesting because he is unpredictable. He's full of himself. He's bumptious. He thinks he's cleverer than he is. He's going to get the Norse gods into trouble, um, tricking them or persuading them all that they're going to actually try and get a wall built for free by a giant and then have to make good on that promise. Otherwise, they're going to lose everything, um, whatever. But you also watch him change as the stories go on. So he gets darker. And eventually, he is going to wind up on the side of the opposition. By the time we get to Ragnarok, it's the gods against Loki. Well, great. Well, Neil Gaiman, thanks for coming to the Wall Street Journal. I appreciate it. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me.